Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Erica Spradley and I love to know where everyone is joining us from. So if you wouldn't mind dropping your location in the chat, that would be awesome, awesome, awesome. We have Canada, Indiana, Arizona, Atlanta, and this is the part where the screen starts racing and I can't keep up. <laughs> I see Florida, Chicago, awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I am so excited about today's conversation and I'm excited for a couple of reasons. The first one being quiet quitting is an extremely popular topic right now. The second reason is that as a Bravely Pro, I get to hear firsthand what employees are thinking regarding culture, capacity, and what they believe it takes to experience career success. So today we're going to discuss how to recognize quiet quitting, ways you can respond to it, and how you can reverse the trend at your company. But before we dive into today's discussion, we'll begin with introductions. So tell us a little bit about you, the experience you hope to bring to the conversation, and how you'd like to support those in attendance. And we'll start with Eunice. Yeah, hi, my name is Eunice. I'm calling in from New York City in Brooklyn today. And I am the People Partner and Talent Development Programs Lead. I know that's a mouthful, add bonusly. <laughs> Um, my role there is to provide strategic and operational people support for leaders. I currently work with our go-to-market teams, but also um, I lead the work in making sure that we are creating systems and structures in which our employees can really thrive in the workplace, whether that's manager training, job competencies, development goals, IDPs, all of which is done through a DEI lens. And I really see the value of all of this, or, you know, I see how the lack of this, right, really leads to quiet quitting. And I think that's something that I would love to discuss with all of y'all today, um, which is a rather self-selecting group. I assume all of you are here because you all want to do, think about the ways in which we can proactively think about our employees who are withdrawing in like the quiet quitting fashion, right? I'm going to stop there. I would love to hear from the other panelists, too. Thank you so much, Eunice. Matt? Yeah, thank you, Eunice. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Matt Faden. I'm a people ops generalist based out of Philadelphia, PA. I'm really fortunate to be working with Guru. And in my role, I'm lucky to be part of the team that manages employee experience here. Some of the individual tasks that help us achieve that goal from a people ops perspective are working through our benefit offerings and, and rolling out open enrollment. Um, I'm fortunate to be working through people analytics and performing various engagement surveys with our population and organizing follow-up um, and overall ensuring that our values practice is acknowledged through things like values and action at our company town halls. Uh, I'm really hoping to share a lot of the best practices that I've learned at my time here in Guru and my career in People Ops, and I'm really excited to bounce those ideas off Eunice, Erica, and Ariel as well. Thank you so much, Matt. Ariel? Hi, my name is Arielle Sedan. I am also a Bravely Pro, um, an executive coach. I work with employees at every rung of their career ladders. Um, to build more confidence and skills and leadership capabilities, um, and also a lot of sustainability in their careers. And so sustainability and quiet quitting are something that tend to go hand in hand. And I'm really excited to talk about it because it is a hot topic. That's why we're all here. <laughs> and um, I'm really excited uh, to see the questions that that come up in the comments and experiences of all of the people who are watching today and in the recordings to um, hear how you're experiencing it, witnessing it, and what kind of perspective we as the panelists up here can provide, but also learn from you. Um, so that's a little bit about me. And for whatever it's worth, I'm based out of New York City. Um, so shout out to all the New Yorkers who are also here watching. 
Hi. <laughs> I love it. I love it. New Yorkers always seem to shout each other out, no matter what webinar you're on. It's so awesome. Thank you all so much for introducing yourselves. So according to Gallup, quiet quitters make up at least 50% of the U.S. workforce, probably more, with a drop in engagement that started in the second half of 2021. So for the sake of today's conversation, I thought it would be great to establish a working definition of what quiet quitting is. Quiet quitting is the practice of reducing the amount of effort one devotes to one's job. It is employees working within defined hours, not extending themselves to go above and beyond. So my first question is, why is there so much talk about quiet quitting now? Is this new or more pronounced than in the past? And Ariel, if you could answer that, we greatly appreciate it. Um, so I think one of the reasons why this is so pronounced right now is because in this remote or hybrid environment that we're experiencing, um, it's just easier to notice without in-person FaceTime, we have to rely on other methods or other uh, observations of what engagement looks like. And so it's really easy to see when people are slow to respond or not staying on or leaving for long stretches because their little uh, status markers go yellow or red. And, and so I think it's more observable now than it might have been in the past, but it's, it's always been a thing. There's a reason why employee engagement has been a topic for so long, and it's because companies recognize the importance of engaging their employees for, yes, the bottom line, but also for their ability to retain and develop the future leaders of the organization. And now in you know, 2020, 2021, now in 2022, there has been a lot of burden placed on the individual employees to not only continue to show up under immense stress and change and anxiety and fear around all of the various components going on internationally, um, not only with the pandemic, but also with all of the social issues that we've seen across the world mm -hmm. and taking on those you know, the daily tasks that they needed for work, their home tasks that are now much more pronounced and continuing to shoulder the expectation of going above and beyond, which has always been the expectation in the workplace. Um, so I think it's not new, um, mm -hmm. but it is something that we're feeling much more acutely. Um, and it definitely helps that it has a trendy name like quiet quitting, which is short and easy and sometimes very controversial um, and tends to uh, sort of activate the spidey senses of, of senior leadership who get scared about people quitting or about completely disengaging. Um, so mixture of, of both. Yes. And I love so much of what you shared, but before I dive into that, I want to make sure that anyone else who wants to speak to this question on the panel has an opportunity to speak. Yeah, so I love everything that you just said, Ariel. I think all of that is super relevant and super topical. I think for sure, social media, TikTok, people, you know, during the pandemic, when we were all at home, just scrolling through all the things that yeah. certainly gave rise to you know how the popularity of the term but like you said it's been there for a while I think that the really important thing here to note is that I mean we can really trace it back to like basic IO psychology right and the idea of equity theory and motivation theory in the sense that people we all want to it's human psychology to want to get back what we are putting in Right. And the idea that employees don't feel like they're getting back what they are putting in or that they're expected right, to sacrifice their humanity and psychological well-being um, for the sake of output. Right. And also mm -hmm. feeling the lack of motivation and the lack. And what I mean by that is feeling not as valued as a person, right? Not being seen holistically as a person who is experiencing so many other things outside of the workplace. I think that it was particularly acute 
um, when we were in the throes of the pandemic in 2020, when schools were shut down with like caregivers, right? Mm. Caretakers of children or people of color, like I'm an Asian woman. And so living in New York City, that has been the, the, the last couple of years have been pretty fraught. And I say that and I name that with all full vulnerability because I know that I probably am not the only one feeling that way, right? Mm -hmm. And I think with all of that said, I think the real key issue here and the reason we're all probably here today is because, I mean, quiet quitting, quiet quitters, it's not a retention issue yet, right? They haven't quit. People haven't left the company. And so it's really the, we really need to think about what are some steps we can take to be proactive about making sure that these folks who are like on the bubble, so to speak, can be re-engaged, can feel like they are, you know, they feel motivated, they feel valued, they feel like they're getting back what they're putting in. I love that. Thank you so much. Matt? I really... Uh, I'd like to leave Eunice and Ariel's thoughts as top of mind for, I really enjoyed how you set the stage there. So I don't know what more to add. Thank you. Thank you so much. One of the things that stood out to me that Ariel mentioned and Eunice touched on, right? The social issues, how, you know, the quiet quitting hybrid remote work situations have impacted Eunice. And it reminds me of a chat question that we actually have posed already. And, and this is from Juan. He says, can we hear opinions on impacts of quiet quitting when it deals with associates of color? I think there are layers to quiet quitting and it hits folks from different communities differently. So if anyone would like to chime in there or who has some thoughts, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, I'd like to at least kick things off if I can. And on this is a really excellent question. Quiet quitting in many cases, it's an indicator of people reestablishing healthy boundaries after going above and beyond in their work for far too long and not seeing a reward for that. People of color and marginalized groups experience this reality more acutely than others. It's just a fact there's been decades of uh, experience within these communities of seeing uh, firsthand where a level of effort may not be matched at a societal or an employer level. Um, but Eunice, Ariel, do you have thoughts on this? I think, I don't know if I, if this is like exactly what the question was asking for, but you know, Jumping off of Matt's point, I think this is kind of where the individual manager plays a really important role, right? Studies show that people leave managers, right? Quiet quitting is partly about managers as well, right? Yes, it is about establishing boundaries as well, which we healthy boundaries are healthy, right? And we all like we are all leading with that fact. But also, I think in terms of people feeling valued, people feeling seen, people feeling checked up on, people feeling supported, right? That's very much to do with managers, giving folks really good, actionable, concrete feedback, right? Like mentoring their direct reports, you know, really helping them navigate the lines between their career and their home life. I think the best managers I know I've had, right, just from my personal experience, have always done that and more. And so I think that's one of the things. And I think, I, I, you know, there's a lot, I can talk about this forever, clearly. That's why I do this, like, to make a living. But <laughs> I think that, you know, when we think about things like that, like helping managers um, have these kind of conversations across lines of difference, whether it's hierarchical, whether it's race, whether it's location, right? I think that in terms of engagement, we can... We've always just assumed that as soon as people got together and were able to have one on one face time engagement will organically happen. And what the last three years have shown us is that actually that organic expectation isn't enough, we have to be way more intentional, way more purposeful about the way we have these discussions, like in one on ones with your manager and your team and your company, and so on and so forth. I also want to just really briefly add that oftentimes, especially for um, 
more marginalized communities, there's a lot of pressure to um, stay part of the system. And oftentimes the ability to sit back um, and not push yourself and not buy into like the hustle culture and, and really like go above and beyond that's a luxury that a lot of people don't have, whether it's because of the color of your skin or where you're from or your financial comfort and stability. Uh, and so the ability to partake in quiet quitting uh, and disengaging isn't an option for everyone. It also is industry dependent, right? Nurses in during the pandemic and doctors couldn't just say, oh, I'm only gonna work my shifts and nothing more, and I'm just going to show up and do the bare minimum, they went above and beyond every day, not only because they are bought into the mission, which of course they are, but also because they didn't have a choice. And what we see in those kinds of industries in the post-pandemic or, you know, sort of downtrend of the pandemic is that there is a lot of turnover. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that when we think about quiet quitting and I'll more specifically call it disengagement. Um, there are people who have no choice but to be disengaged because they have other life priorities that require their attention. And so they kind of make that trade off of, I'm going to plateau in my career, at least for now, and do the bare minimum to keep my job and keep my financial security and job security. But I can't do more than that. And then there are the people who have the luxury of saying, you know, like, I'm just going to step back and do the bare minimum and in an almost, dare I say, like passive aggressive kind of way, I'm going to take what I deserve because putting in more has not served me up until this point. So I, I, I think this shows up a lot with people from um, more marginalized backgrounds. Um, and I hear that often from my clients who are concerned about job security they're not going to be the ones who check out because they cannot afford, they can't afford to. Thank you so much. I was making a note and I'm always taking notes as people are speaking, but this expectation to go above and beyond and there has been so much engagement in the chat. So thank you all so much for chiming in and posing your questions around quiet quitting and the expectation to go above and beyond when in actuality, it sounds like people are incorporating boundaries. It sounds like people are wanting work-life balance and that they actually are not quitting, which leads me to um, my next question. What are additional lenses to translate quiet quitting into experiences we understand? So for example, and someone just placed in the chat, quiet quitting is self-care. <laughs> Thank you so much for chiming in in the chat. For example, based on the definition, some would say employees aren't disengaged. They are simply introducing boundaries in an effort to perform better and reduce burnout. What are your thoughts on that, Matt? Yeah, thank you, Erica. And well, on your last question and the discussion we heard from Ariel and Eunice, it, it really, it does lead well into this translation element too. Quiet quitting implies that employees are taking advantage of their employers by doing a bare minimum to avoid, from this negative perspective, to avoid losing their job. In reality, employers, this it's an indicator that employers aren't meeting changing needs of, of our employees. The question that we as people ops leaders need to be asking of our peers, of our teams, how can we address the underlying issues that are driving the trend mm. and instead focus on re-engagement or engagement. You know, Adam Grant has supported this. There was a tweet I saw the other day where he said, um, like, don't ask how we can get more out of our employees, right? Our, our employees are burnt out. Uh, we need to be asking how do we ensure they're respected, they're performing meaningful work and are compensated fairly for that. Um, so if you see, Say you have a high performing employee and you realize that over time they've been a little bit less engaged or they haven't been as enthusiastic about their work. Uh, it's not that they're intentionally quietly quitting on you. They're 
intentionally resetting a boundary or they're resetting burnout or for some reason the uh, employer hasn't been engaging them appropriately so like you another term that kind of reflects this work-life integration that's something that uh, our attendees here might have heard that's all about setting boundaries and that's very accepted uh, in a lot of the workplaces we're working to create today um, so that's a little bit about how we're trying to rethink the word quiet quitting here at Guru and more focus on how employers can just let's think about engagement instead. Matt, I really, I, I love what you just said. I think also that makes me think about the fact that, you know, we talk about quiet quitting all the time. And to be completely honest with you, I know that this is a whole webinar and a panel on quiet quitting, but to be completely real, I'm not a huge fan of the term. I'm sure many people will also agree with me here, mainly because I think that it puts the onus of the, the burden on the individual, right? When really there are lots of other systemic issues here at play. I think we as a group have talked about this before. Like, you know, we when if we're going to talk about quiet quitting, we also have to talk about quiet firing and quiet promotions too, right? These it's corollaries. And it's corollaries because you know quiet firing is sort of when you when you don't receive feedback or praise right um also when like your one-on-ones are frequently canceled or reshuffled and never rescheduled again and your one-on-ones don't have concrete agendas there is no real pathway for you to work on cool projects or really important stretch work, right? There's no real way for you to contribute in a way that is meaningful to you. And mm -hmm. also like recognition is, isn't meaningful or valuable. Um, you're never kept in the loop about what is happening in terms of the company trajectory. Just all of those, you're not onboarded properly. So like you come on board and you come to this new job and it's the basic expectation is sink or swim, which is exhausting. And you're like, I don't know how to swim though, but somehow you have to figure out how to do all of that um, while also taking care of yourself mentally and everything that is going on in the world. And so I think those are the kind of things that makes people feel disengaged right? It's you, you end up feeling incompetent. You feel like you're in a silo. You feel underappreciated that you, that, you know, you will find yourself performing not up to par because you haven't been supported in that way, or you will find yourself just leaving for another job, right? And then the company will say, well, the, that person didn't really do a good job anyway, right? And so it really is, it really should be a partnership, right? Between like, it's that's the whole equity theory. You need to get back what you're putting in. If you are putting in the work, right? If you're showing up, you're doing the work. And we're not really talking about just working the number of hours worked, right? It's it's disengaging during the hours worked. And so if you are putting in the work during your set hours, I mean, you need to think about like what is it that we as a company and people leader and managers, like what are we giving back to our employees, right? Which is development and learning and growth. It's basic human desires and needs. I I want to add, um, I think there's so much emphasis in this idea of quiet quitting, like Eunice said, on the individual, like it's the individual's fault, but it's such a systemic issue, like it comes from somewhere. And I think historically, the expectation to go above and beyond has been, you know, if you go above and beyond, if you put in the work, if you're a great worker, you will be rewarded, you will get a promotion, you will get a raise, you will eventually make partner, you will be part of this great mission and, and more responsibility and more going above and beyond and, and eventually you will be rewarded. And that has not been the case. Um, especially in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, I can't remember the statistics, but you know, the discrepancy between CEO pay and entry level pay, the in the past, it was something like the CEO made 30 times more than the lowest paid person in the organization. And now it's something like 500 times more. And so there is a, a, a big shift in people's belief that they will make it if they just work hard enough and the systemic challenges that i can't speak for all organizations but every organization i've ever worked for and worked with had a performance review that scaled from 
uh, you know, not meeting expectations ever, or, you know, basically needs improvement on every thing to exceeds expectation all the time. Well, if we're all expected to exceed expectations all the time, and that is an organizational expectation and requirement in order to be promoted, if you don't get fives on everything, you won't be promoted. Fives are impossible. They No one gets a five on everything. And eventually you, you will feel like your effort isn't paying off and you won't have clarity around what is that certain je ne sais quoi that gets you to a five. And that that is one of the primary things that I've seen lead to burnout for people that they just don't have the energy, the capability or the clarity to exceed expectations on every level all the time and go above and beyond because they will never reach the carrot that reward is continuously going to be dangled and they will never, it's like a never ending hallway that they're trying to run down. So they are going to slow down and they are going to step back. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stop there on my rant about. <laughs> <laughs> we'll call it your contribution. It wasn't a rant. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing and, and listening to you all and, and seeing what's happening in the chat and the questions that are coming in. And again, thank you all so much for being so engaged around this topic. I can't help but think about some of my experiences, not only as a coach and a consultant, but also as um, an employee who left their full-time job during the pandemic. And I can remember historically that the reward for doing great work was doing more work. And then the pandemic hits, and now we're talking about burnout. We're talking about this new normal. So we looked at different definitions of how we could define normal. But I just wonder, and, and I'd love to hear from the panelists around this, do you feel that employers and companies have redefined the term engagement based on what has happened over the last couple of years? I actually don't think that companies have defined what engagement looks like at all, mm. not before and certainly not now. I, I don't think that, um, I'll say it differently. I think that companies know that they want engagement and I think that they know that it's important to prioritize and to work on. Yes. But I don't know that they, a lot of companies have baselined what that actually looks like in practice and what are the markers of engagement? What do employees who are engaged look like, sound like, how do they show up? What qualities are they bringing into their conversations? What kind of projects are they working on? What is the development pipeline? Um, I don't know that a lot of companies have done that initial baselining. So the if the expectation is to go above and beyond all the time, then that probably also pertains to engagement with no clarity around what those metrics actually look like in practice. And so when an employee becomes disengaged, it might just be relative to where they were before rather than based on objective markers or objective KPIs that they can call out. So um, I think that's something that a lot of companies can take on as a, a, like a takeaway or action step to say, okay, well, let's assume we don't have, we're starting from scratch mm -hmm. and we want employees to feel like they're part of this culture, like they belong, like they're engaged and they're part of co-creating our future and can eventually become leadership of this country, of this <laughs> company. Mm -hmm. um, how do we know who those people are? What are the markers? What should we be looking out for? What should we encourage? And how do we develop um, structures and scaffolding and pipelines to create more of those qualities and more bring in more of those people who will sort of self-reinforce that engagement? And Ariel, I agree with you. Um, you know, there are tools that individual companies are doing well, but to, at scale, there are so many indicators that we're not engaging at a level that we need to right now and not meeting the needs, the changing needs of our employees. Slack's uh, future, future forum, their think tank. For Q3, you know, so the last uh, calendar quarter, the percentage of desk workers in the United States who are feeling 
burnout is 43%, which is a huge increase. So some of those indicators are just continuing to go up. So individual companies, for sure, some are doing better um, at, at scale. There's, there's a lot of work to do, so. Thank you, Matt. And I was going to say, I see you nodding, Eunice. Did you have something or was that just an agreement? Um, well, I agree with everything that came out of this panel. I will say, I think that, I mean, I don't know if I'm like stepping all over, like what, what the next questions might be, but I think there are definitely steps that people can, like as people, leaders and companies um, can take. I think I saw something in the chat about individual managers and senior leaders feeling burnout too, and also quite quitting as a result as well, which I 100,000% agree with. I think that it has to be, I mean, I I used to be work in the public sector before, and we used to call it grassroots and grass tops, right? It has to come from <laughs> from bottom up and top to bottom it's both things at once while there are individual steps that individual managers can take there also has to be something that is also um failed across the organization I think one of the one of the things that we did recently at Bonusly and I'm not saying that everything that we do is perfect certainly this is so personal to me because it's something that everyone also at Bonusly also deals with but I think one of the things that we did do recently that I found really powerful was the people team had stay interviews with literally every single person in the organization um, and I think through that we were able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks ask them how they were doing talk through some of the ways in which we can support them as an organization organization and we're all still like collating and you know aggregating all the data that we've gotten but I think what's been really cool slash also sometimes disheartening is that is how there are so many like through lines and trends across the organization regardless of what what function people work in and I think that that's something that definitely um while we're at a size where we can do that but I think you know, moving forward, that's something that we definitely want to build in within the culture, if not like every person in the company all at once, then maybe like staggering it. Um, the state interviews were in person. It was one-on-one -on -one in person. We also do our online surveys, engagement surveys. And one of the, my favorite things was after the engagement survey, the leadership team answered like all of the points, like one by one. It was a massive Google doc, but you know, but it was a massive Google Doc in which they laid out like their response to some of the things in which, you know, some of the feedback they had gotten and laid out an action plan. Nobody wants to feel like they're screaming into a void, right? And I think it's one of the things that 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 is one of the things that causes disengagement. People feel like I'm I'm saying all of these things and no one actually responds to it. And so I'm just like talking to myself and no one wants to feel that way. And so I mean. I'm, I'm going to stop there for now, <laughs> but clearly like this is my soapbox and I got on it for a hot second. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. And, and this is one of the reasons why I believe this webinar is so important to have, right? We all could spend so much time talking about this topic and, you know, what we can do to have more engagement things we can continue doing that are going well and, and what we can change. So thank you all so much for sharing your perspective around engagement. And I pose that question because we keep hearing about employees who are not engaged. But if we haven't defined what engagement is, then how do we really know? So someone has actually chimed in and said, I would love to get a write-up with what are the metrics to define engagement? That's really great. So I said that to say thank you all again for chiming in. And I keep hearing about, right, disengagement. So I'd like to pose a question, and, and Matt, I'd love to hear your thoughts around this. How do we identify unhappy employees? Because a lot of times there is this stigma, right? If someone is disengaged, then apparently they're unhappy. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that was such, uh, this is such a good question. And at Guru, there's a metric that we use to measure and define engagement. Um, it's called a Vega factor, which we capture through a survey called total motivation. Mm -hmm. And the Vega factor tells us how much purpose, play, and potential does an employee feel relative to economic pressure, 
emotional pressure or just job inertia in their workplace. And play would be um, you do your work because you enjoy it. Purpose would be you value the work's impact. Potential is the work, it, it lies as part of your identity or your potential to grow. Um, so we use this information to point us towards employees that aren't feeling play, purpose, and potential at work. It allows us to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, elevate action items that we can present at our quarterly people ops meetings. Um, we also know if people aren't responding to those surveys, if they're not engaging with it at all, or at, at Guru, we use our own product uh, to send company-wide, important company-wide announcements. Uh, if people aren't engaging with that information, then it's an indicator as a whole that our culture needs work in order to make people feel more included in uh, the company's mission. Um, so I, I love looking at things like Vega Factor or an employee NPS or our existing tools like sending survey announcements, seeing what participation rates are. Thank you, Matt. Anyone else have any thoughts around that question? How we identify unhappy employees? I think in the past when we were in a live, fully live environment, I should say, um, like you could walk in on employees crying in the bathroom, right? Like that was a thing that, I mean, I used to be a consultant. I would see people on my client sites crying all the time in the bathroom. Um, says a lot about what's going on on the ground. And more often than not, it wasn't about things that were going on at home. Um, it was, you know, issues that came up in meetings or, you know, having really harsh feedback that was delivered in a not kind way um, or feeling continuously stonewalled, not getting a promotion that you thought was in the bag, like all of these things would come up and, and they create emotions. And most people are, um, you know, it's hard to hide those things. And you see them more often when you're in person, when you're in a remote environment, it's easier to turn off your camera or, you know, not show up to a meeting last minute or not say anything or compose yourself and, and come back to the screen. Um, so it's, it's easier to hide um, but I think that mm, the people that you engage with the most know you, maybe not as well as they might have once known you, but they know you and they can tell when your responses are a little bit shorter. Your manager can tell when you're just sort of checking things off in a one-to-one -one and, and not really there and engaged and excited and and so there are sort of those nonverbal cues that can come up that demonstrate that something is up. Maybe you're not unhappy if you can quantify happiness, but something is off. And so we have an opportunity then to think about, okay, well, if something is off, then how can I as a teammate or as a manager or as a, even as a direct report or just a human being in a meeting with somebody else, call it out and say on the side, hey, I see that that something is off. Do you want to talk about it? You know, what, what can we do to, you know, lift your mood or engage you or excite you or what support do you need? Or if you're stuck on something, let's talk about it. Let's brainstorm. Um, let's come up with solutions. Or do you just need to vent? Um, people used to vent a lot at the water cooler in the bathroom, and now they don't have coworkers that they can talk to as mm -hmm. much in a non- formal and also non-recorded kind of way, unless you're texting with someone offline on a private device, you're likely to be witnessed. And so I, I think that um, unhappiness, um, there are ways that we can quantify engagement and, and KPIs that we can look into and motivation, just like Matt was talking about, but we can also notice how people are showing up and see changes in behavior from a nonverbal perspective and just be humans about it and reach out and try and be more supportive, even if it's not going to be about work all the time. Um, people who feel more part of their communities are more likely to engage with those communities. They're more likely to strengthen those communities. 
And so recognizing the humanity of somebody and seeing and noticing and letting them know, like, I see you, I hear you, I see that something is off, I see that you're not happy. Um, that alone can let people know that they're not screaming into the void, right? That there is someone who knows them, who cares um, at least enough to, to call it out and, and let them know that you're there for them. I love I think, that. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. No, go ahead. You think? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, I think this circles back to, for me, this is like a full circle moment because I think there we can't fully expect technology, right? Surveys that we take async to tell us all the things we need. It is a combination of both quantitative data and qualitative data, which I think brings me back to the point of that I, I think was my first point, which is that all of this, particularly in this remote hybrid work that we live in right now in this messy times, um, we need to be more purposeful and more intentional about communicating. I think somebody mentioned earlier in the chat about making sure that companies understand like what are the expectations for communication. One of the best things that I saw recently, and later I thought to myself, that seemed so simple, um, which is to map communication channels across the organization, just because sometimes people are feel lost because they don't know how to ask questions or they don't know where to ask questions or who to ask questions, right? Just little things like mapping communication channels, the expectations for communication can be so powerful. And also in, in making sure that we are creating spaces in which people can gather um, across lines of difference. I think I saw things about generational differences on here. And I think part of that is via communication as well, right? I think generationally people, I mean, I'm a millennial, um, and so, if, so I think it's one of those things where p different generations have different values or things that they grew up with. And I think that that's all totally fine and valid, but the idea is, you know, we need to be able to share it and talk about it with each other. And that can't happen in this world, like in this remote hybrid 2022 world that we're all living in without some kind of intentionality, even though that might seem really difficult at first, right? I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask uh, this question, and I know that just based on what I'm seeing in the chat, the conversation we're having, the questions that are being posed, what is it that companies can do to keep their employees engaged and feel valued? Eunice? Yeah, I think we've um, all three of us have talked about this and, uh, you know, in various moments throughout this entire panel, but I think to sort of sum everything up, I, for me, it's really, it's, it's really empowering managers, like it all comes from empowering people top down and bottom up, right? Mm -hmm. I think part of what we can do is empower managers. Um, I think often part of quiet quitting what that comes from is people feeling like they're being micromanaged or they're being surveilled or watched. And I think that comes about not because people managers are awful people. I think oftentimes, you know, people managers have been thrust in this position where they are managing a team or managing direct reports without having been given the, the tools that the toolkit they need to be successful at that job. Just because I wasn't awesome you know, a software engineer, which I'm not, but just because if I was, right, and I became an engineering manager, that doesn't mean that I would be an amazing people manager. I think that's a whole nother skill set and a whole nother job. And I think part of client quitting comes from managers feeling anxious, right? They don't really know the, the do's and don'ts, right? They don't, they don't, they themselves have not been empowered to empower others. And so then we, then they lean into what comes easiest, which is micromanaging, which is wanting to know what people are doing at all times, like that kind of stuff and not really giving, not trusting themselves, right? Mm -hmm. To trust their team. And I think part of what we need to do is empower managers to empower their team across lines of difference. I think another thing is really um, acting quickly, right? I think I mentioned what Bonusy does about engagement surveys and we did our stay interviews. I think I saw a few questions about the stay interviews. I'm more than happy to answer that specifically like later down the road, but I think responding to those things, right? Mm -hmm. I think is really important. 
and also transparency. Like, I think, I mean, that was part hand in hand with transparency. I also think there is a real difference between transparency and clarity. I, I like to think, I mean, this is this might sound kind of rude, but I think transparency is really like, it can veer into, I mean, like word vomiting, right? Just because you have a word salad about something doesn't mean that it's transparent. People really want to know, how is that relevant to me, right? It's not that folks want to know, like want to be in the seat of decision making all the time. They just want to understand the rationale behind it. So I think that's important. Um, and also, I think the whole idea, we, I talked a lot about like manager training, but I also think developing individuals is really crucial. I think having individual development plans, one of the things that Bonusly rolled out recently were our job, we call it job ladders, but it's really like ex expectations and competencies for every single role of every single level. And I think that clears up a lot of some of the concerns and questions about, you know, like me being expected to do something that is to quote unquote way beyond my pay grade, right? And really, and for me having clear ideas of what I need to do and where I need to improve in order to get to the next step. I think that eliminates some of that subjectivity. Um, I'm going to pause there, but truly I can talk about this all day and all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. You shared some great advice and points. I'd love to hear from the other panelists. I'm going to just jump in really quickly um, because I saw something, a couple of comments in the chat um, that I think are important to call out. And um, I agree with Eunice that so much of a, uh, like addressing uh, engagement comes down to, to managers. Um, senior leadership is um, they need to be bought in and they need to buy in and they need to support mm -hmm. and be the people to empower and cascade everyone down the line to engage people in those kinds of conversations. But they're not going to be the ones going down to the floor and talking to each person. It's not feasible. Um, I think part of the challenge is that managers are also employees and they're also burned out and they're sandwiched between competing priorities. They want to manage their team and more often than not, they want to do a good job, whether or not they're equipped with the tools is, is another question, but they want to be a good manager. They also have expectations coming at them from the individuals, right? Help me develop, tell me what to do, give me guidance, show me the way, give me, you know, give me all of the insights that will help me progress. And they're also feeling the pressure from their managers and from senior leadership to produce, to meet those performance goals, to meet the output requirements, to meet the deadlines, regardless of whether or not all of those things are reasonable. And so they are constantly playing this game of tug of war between their own needs and desires as an individual, their team's needs as individuals and as a team, and their managers and the organization's needs from a performance perspective. And it is so hard to be stuck in that space all the time and to not have authority to actually enact any sort of change, right? You think about just salary conversations, a manager can't give a salary increase or a bonus without addressing it with his manager or with HR. They're, they don't have the power to do that or to provide on the spot stay bonuses for most people. And, and maybe this isn't true across all companies, but more often than not. And so they aren't empowered, they're constantly stuck. And so they're also frustrated and they're also at risk of, of leaving or disengaging. And so I think part of um, part of this conversation is also how do we ensure that managers who are like our front line in this engagement, I hate to use battle terminology, but like they're, they're the front line. How do we make sure that they're equipped with the authority and the capability and the confidence and the trust of the organization and their leaders to do what will be right for the individual in the moment so they can react to things in on the in the conversation on the spot make sure that people can get the support that they need 
without needing to go now into approval loops and budget approvals and, and take things up the chain and lose the momentum and the trust of the individuals on the ground who are looking to them for guidance and for support and who want to be re-engaged, but just they you lose steam along the way. Um, so just, I think recognizing that managers are in a tough spot is also so important. And as senior leaders and as HR leaders, can we ensure that those managers are equipped with the tools and authority and capabilities to execute on re-engaging and continuously engaging employees in order to help the organization meet its goals as a whole? I'm really picking up what you two are putting down. <laughs> um, this is, there are so many factors that can influence whether employees feel engaged benefits your hiring practices how you develop your culture uh, but i love how you two have both talked about how we organize our communication and where we find information um, and how we tool employees to actually solve some of these problems for themselves or, or in conjunction with their managers uh, one of the top indicators of burnout is lack of access to critical task critical information guru happens to be solving like this it's a tool to provide trusted task critical transparent uh non-food salad <laughs> non-word salad information uh into the hands of anyone at your company uh, there's our amazing community operations team they're working to address burnout indicators from a remote first world uh, they have partnered with an org called Marco Experiences to provide remote first events that can engage people no matter where they are. Um, things like trivia, uh, little parties, escape room type events. Um, the, the biggest thing that Guru is doing, our objective number one for our company is employee engagement and making sure that we are reaching certain metrics from our Vega factor, from our ENPS surveys. So Eunice, I think you also talked about it. It has to be top down. You, you wanna be able to point to something so important to the foundation of the rest of your productivity at work. And at Guru, at least, OKR1 is having an employee population that's engaged. Awesome. Thank you all so much. I'm sorry, I saw, Eunice. I saw a question here that said, name some tools that will give managers the ability to grow. I okay, think hold that thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hold that thought. I saw that too. And mm -hmm. we only have a few minutes left and I want to make sure that I capture something else that is the message above that. And it's to learn about how to increase happiness and meet the needs of your employees. Check out Bravely's blog, The Workplace Happiness Revolution. And for those of you who have posed questions in the chat in the Q&A, thank you so much. We do have a few minutes remaining. So if you wouldn't mind posing questions in the Q&A, that would be great. We'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. And before we get to the one that you were about to read, Eunice, there's one that I have been wanting to ask um, that someone posed earlier. And I don't know if it's the same person because it was anonymous. And then it came back and was like, can we get to the... <laughs> To this question. So it might be the same person. I definitely want to get to it. And it's how much of this do you feel is perceived as a generational gap? And this is to anyone on the panel who wants to answer, answer excuse me. It says our generation worked 12 hour days because we had to. This new work generation just doesn't have the same work ethic. I've heard them all. So anyone who wants to speak to um, these generations in the workplace, and how this impacts quiet quitting as she jumps out of her seat. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I love this question um, because it is so, I think the generational differences account for a lot of the frustration around the terminology. Um, and one of the things that I hear a lot, especially from clients who are in more of like the, um, I'll put it, say like traditional industries, accounting and professional services, people like non, I'll say non-tech, uh, the non-tech world um, are facing this a lot because a lot of the leadership is older, typically male, um, comes from this, you know, I worked, you know, I was up at 3 a.m. with the, with the 
cows, you know, in the factories with my clients type of mentality, which is super, super valid. Um, the, the transition that I think has been happening over the past 20, 30 years has been, um, in a couple of different areas, right? One is, um, the divide of labor, um, primarily in the home. So for a lot of the, um, older, predominantly male leaders that I hear these kinds of things from, you know, young people these days, they're lazy, they're entitled, they're ungrateful. These are, I hear this a lot. Um, but a lot of those folks had people at home supporting them, taking care of the kids, being the ones to pick up the kids from school, making dinner, cleaning the home. Um, they had someone at home, whether it was their partner or home help or teachers and after school activities and all of these systems that they were able to build for themselves um, that took care magically of all of these things that they didn't need to take on the mental load for. And now when we're seeing more than 50% of the workforce, at least the, the majority of the workforce, not including senior leadership is female, we're not seeing the same, uh, like you can't have the same reliance on the free labor of women in the home. And so, yes, people have different priorities and younger generations are prioritizing their careers and they're prioritizing building up their financial resources and financial independence and education and professional development over starting families earlier. And we're seeing that pretty much across the globe as a trend. Um, and yes, that means that they have less time and resources and, and energy to, um, to, to allocate. So I think part of the question, well, I think I'm sort of contradicting myself a little bit, but I'll clarify. One is there are more women in the workforce, um, but now that people are like both genders or all genders are in the workforce, now people need to also shift their priorities outside of work and be available to share mental load and share responsibilities across all aspects of their lives. And I think the ability to reprioritize is, um, is the thing that's leading to this generational divide that older generations either, they didn't have the luxury a lot of times to reprioritize and um, and they had support in different ways that um, that this generation has less of, or they're more willing to compromise and make those kinds of trade offs. Um, so I think, you know, that's kind of like a surface layer of the generational issue. Um, but if if Eunice or Matt, if you guys have any other um, thoughts on the generational divide, I'd love to hear from you guys also. I mean. Briefly, I saw Kate in the chat acting. It, she feels like she's acting as a translator between generations. That That's exactly what it is. Culture Studies, Ann Helen Peterson has an awesome perspective on this. I recommend you check out her blog on quiet quitting. Um, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> It's hard. I know. I know. We have like two minutes left. And as we shared earlier, we could talk about this all day and all night. But Eunice, was there something that you wanted to add to that before we wrap up today? Um, no, I mean, lots, but I will hold <laughs> my thought to keep us on time. I think that both Matt and Ariel spoke very thoroughly in the short time they had about the generational divide. I think that the way you can bridge it, though, is I think we talked about this earlier is naming the expectations, right? And really thinking about what are traditions versus preferences versus requirements. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all so much for engaging us with this conversation. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Eunice. Thanks to all of you who have joined us for this dialogue around quiet quitting. And I'm sure um, there will be more to discuss around this topic. So before we leave the space today, just wanted to share this information with you around Guru. 
uh, for those of you um, who are interested, there's also some additional information on the screen about Bonusly. We invite you to check that out. In addition, for those of you who have the capacity and are also interested in this as well, you can download the Bravely Guide, the ROI of coaching. You can just scan that QR code. And last but certainly not least, um, we have some recertification codes that are here on the screen for you as well. I saw a lot of information um, in the chat asking if there's going to be a replay um, sent out. Yes, you will get the recording link. So again, thank you all so much for joining us for today's conversation. We appreciate you all and have a wonderful day.